Good afternoon and welcome to the DCRI Research Conference and welcome to those of you that are, are watching from afar. A Just as a reminder, we do archive each of these presentations so that you can go onto the DCRI website and onto the archive and uh, re review it at your leisure, which I, I commonly will, uh, will do. I'm pleased to introduce today's uh, speaker, Dr. Leslie uh, Curtis. She's an associate professor in the Center for Clinical and Genetic Economics at the DCRI and at Duke University Medical Center. Leslie's background seems to be perfect for the work that, that she, she does as I was looking through her CV and, and, and statement that uh, she performed her bachelor's work in economics from Washington University and then a master's of science degree in public policy analysis followed by a doctorate in health services research, uh, both uh, of the latter at the University of, uh, of Rochester. She's actively involved in projects uh, utilizing observational data to address questions related to clinical and comparative effectiveness, safety, and delivery of health care in Medicare populations. And most of her work is in three areas, in cardiovascular disease, uh, VI, and oncology. So she's here today to speak about FDA's uh, mini Sentinel program and building an infrastructure for active safety surveillance. Nicely welcome. Great. Thank you very much. There we go. Thank you. Good, good. Well, it's great to be here today to uh, tell you all a little bit about the, the Mini Sentinel program. Um, I've, I've had the, the pleasure of working on this project for the last little over, over a year now. Um, I feel like I need to begin with some relevant disclosures here. I am funded by FDA for my work with Mini Sentinel, so I've been drinking the Mini Sentinel Kool-Aid, as I said, for, for over a year now. Um, I also really want Duke investigators to become involved in this. There's, there's funding, there's some really interesting questions, and this is a high priority for FDA. So I think it's a great opportunity for faculty, fellows, lots of us to, to get involved. Um, I also need to remind everyone or tell everyone that Mini Sentinel is funded via a contract mechanism, which means that response times tend to be fairly short. Um, and for those of you who haven't had the privilege of working on a federal contract before, I just point you to this, my favorite now, Dilbert cartoon, which at the left says, we want a huge government contract. Now we need to follow all of our company policies plus every government procurement rule, and at the right, Dilbert says, I feel like I'm being smothered by a damp mattress, to which the boss says, that's what victory feels like. <laughs> <laughs> so first, a little recent history. And, and that may be the only chuckle, really, when we're talking about FDA mini Sentinel. That, you know, that, that may be it for today. Um, <laughs> First of all, let me begin with some recent history. Um, the FDA Amendments Act of 2007, uh, section, I think, 905, mandated that FDA establish a post-market risk identification and analysis system to um, link and then analyze safety data from a variety of sources with the goals of including about 20 data from 25 million individuals by July 1st of 2010, and data from at least 100 million individuals in this safety system uh, by July 1st of 2012. Um, the, the act referred to a variety of sources of data, including federal health data from the VA, from CMS, and also private sector health record data, health record electronic data. So Sentinel Initiative is FDA's response to this mandate. Um, and they set out as their objectives to improve FDA's capability to identify and evaluate safety issues in real time. And to enhance FDA's ability to evaluate safety systems not easily evaluated by the current passive surveillance systems. Um, and really what this, in particular, they wanted to do was to expand their ability to access subgroups and special populations, 
um, to get FDA access to longitudinal data, which their current passive systems really don't allow, and then also to get FDA access to those kinds of adverse events that occur fairly commonly in the population, but tend not to be reported in the passive surveillance system. So in those, you tend to get the sort of strange, odd outcomes, rare outcomes that, that occur. Um, if, if you missed it a few, maybe a, six weeks ago now, um, the, the leadership of Mini Sentinel with FDA published a, a piece in the New England Journal that really describes pretty nicely the work that we've done so far. Um, so I would, I would recommend this to you for some light reading. Um, in fall of 2009, then, uh, FDA let the Mini Sentinel contract to Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. Rich Platt is the, is the PI of, of Mini Sentinel. And Mini Sentinel is essentially the pilot of the Sentinel initiative. And in that contract, um, Harvard Pilgrim and the Mini Sentinel team was charged with developing a scientific operations kind of infrastructure for the Sentinel initiative. Again, the idea is whatever's created for Mini Sentinel evolves over time into what becomes the Sentinel initiative for FDA. Um, and, and also to create a coordinating center that would provide FDA with this continuous access to automated healthcare data. Um, and FDA had really two interests here. One was to provide kind of a laboratory for methods development. As I'll, as I'll talk about later, the, the setup of these, these automated data systems, it's, it's different maybe from what some of us are used to working with. And there are some uh, methodological challenges associated with using these data. Um, the agency also wanted to have an opportunity to evaluate safety issues um, that were of interest to them. So they didn't just want this to be about methods development, but they wanted to be able to use these data to answer questions. And they also wanted the coordinating center to educate them, FDA, about how better to do this kind of active safety surveillance work. So there's this educational component, answering questions, developing a system, a lot of things rolled up into this contract. So what do we mean by evaluating safety issues? Um, this slide just sort of shows crudely maybe a, a spectrum of what we might consider to be um, safety surveillance, right? Um, and at the far left, we have signal generation. That refers to some collection of methods. Sometimes people call this data mining, although we don't really use that term here. But um, a collection of methods that could identify potential associations between use of some drug, use of a device, and an outcome of interest. Um, signal refinement is the process of actually evaluating some of those suspected associations that pop up during the process of, of signal generation. Um, and then signal evaluation really refers to the formal epidemiological studies that are undertaken to establish or refute causality um, between some observed exposure and, and outcome. And what's important to keep in mind or to know is that the mini sentinel work falls smack dab in the middle. So we're not talking about um, doing that, I'll use the word data mining, but you, doing that sort of data mining activity to generate lots of signals that then someone else will chase down. Nor are we talking about doing in-depth epidemiological studies for every exposure outcome pair of interest. We're, we're in the middle here, providing additional information. That information goes, to F, goes back to FDA so that they can decide, does this warrant a full epidemiological study or, or not? Or in rare cases, can we maybe make a decision on the basis of what we get from the signal refinement phase? Okay, so that's sort of the introduction to Mini Sentinel, Sentinel, and some basic concepts. And what I really want to do today is spend some time talking about what, what we've accomplished so far, what we did in the first year, what our near-term priorities are, and in the process, encourage you to think about how you might be interested in becoming involved in this work. Um, so let's begin with, with the deliverables. And what, what I've listed here are all of those deliverables that were identified over the five-year term of the, of the contract. Some of them we've, we've achieved and others have yet to, we've yet to, to tackle. Um, let me begin by talking about the 
deliverables for this organizational model and, and principles and, and policies. And from an organizational perspective, FDA said, we want a coordinating center, we want you to bring together some data partners, and we want to make sure you have content expertise around the table, um, and then we need some operating principles policies. Um, I really dislike organizational charts in PowerPoint slides, but I, I had to put this in just so you would sort of see where we, Duke, are connected to this by virtue of my participation. So um, I lead with, with Mark Wiener, I co-lead the data core, um, which I'll talk more about later. Um, and we are actively involved, therefore, in this operation center, the coordinating center that's been established for, for FDA. Um, through that and also through the planning board on which I sit, we have regular conference calls with, with FDA, with other folks um, represented by this, by this chart. Um, so we're not only involved in kind of implementing FDA's priorities, but we're also involved in helping establish FDA's priorities. So right now we've settled on, you know, what our year two, we know what our year two work plan is because we're in year two, but we've begun to talk about what the year three work plan is and what the year four work plan might look like. Um, the distributed data partners, this slide just kind of shows who's, who's at the table currently and at least in some way, shape, or form has said we have data that, that we could bring to bear on the work of, of Mini Sentinel. Um, this includes, you know, administrative claims type data, includes electronic medical records, um, data from inpatient facilities, inpatient medical records, as well as registries. Um, for the data work that we've done so far, it's really been with the data partners that you see here, focused on administrative and claims data. So as I talk more about the work of the data core, keep in mind that these are the, these are the folks that, that I'm talking about. Um, in terms of principles and policies, the, the governance committee of, of Mini Sentinel um, spend a lot of time hammering out some policies and, and uh, rules of, of the road. I've just highlighted a few here. I think the most important one is that um, FDA requested um, a determination from OHRP that this work be considered public health practice and not research. So the work that we are doing in Mini Sentinel does not fall under the purview of IRBs. Um, that's important. A question that often comes up is how can we use this amazing resource for research? And that bullet is something that, that has to be addressed. One of our ability to sort of re, uh, to respond quickly, to be flexible, really hinges on this being public health practice under that, um, contained under that. Um, we all agreed uh, on the principle of minimizing the transfer of PHI and proprietary data. Um, as I'll describe later, these data really sit behind institutional firewalls in a distributed um, network. Um, we're committed to a, the public availability of our work products. So I'll point you to the, the Mini Sentinel website, which continues to grow and really has kind of everything that we're doing. Tools, methods, protocols, computer programs, documentation, and the like. Um, we, we all agreed that the data partner's participation should be completely voluntary. So for any activity, a data partner can say, eh, we're not interested in this, we're not going to do this. Hasn't really happened yet, but they have that, they have that flexibility. Um, transparency, confidentiality, we're, we're certainly learning a lot about FDA's priorities and that's not something that we can talk a lot about. Um, and, and then having a very clear conflict of interest policy for individuals. So now I'm going to talk about the data side of deliverables. And I'll, I'll say at the outset that I give this a lot more attention than I give the, the methods and protocol development for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I think it's really helpful to understand kind of what this data resource looks like because that's the platform on which the methods and the protocols are built. And also the data stuff is what I've been working in for the last year, so that's kind of what I think is the most interesting. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the Mini Sentinel relies on a distributed data approach, right? So 
all of the data partners' data remain behind institutional firewalls. And access to that data, access, if you will, is completely under the, the um, data partners choose when people get to access their data. I'll describe later that, that programs are developed centrally, sent to the data partners, executed there, and then results are returned to the central location. Um, for any of you who've been involved in HMO research network activities, some other activities with Kaiser, um, you'll, you'll recognize this, this approach. So, um, it's really useful and important because it helps to maintain privacy. It helps to um, allow the data partners to really maintain that operational and physical control over their data. And for many of the data partners, they're not just um, they're not data vendors. They're actually healthcare providers who happen to sit on a lot of really useful healthcare data. Um, so. Back to this distributed data network, I mean, what that really requires, step one, is that you develop a common data model, right? You define each variable of interest, and everyone agrees to those definitions and agrees to transform their data into those definitions so that when the program is written centrally, gets sent out to each of the sites, they run it, and there, there's no, there are no blips. Everyone has transformed their data identically. So, this common data model becomes a really key bit of work to do early on. Um, I'll talk briefly about the, the guiding principles that we, that we developed here. There were 11 in total. Um, I've, I would say none are really more important than the, none is more important than the others, but um, these are three that I think are particularly um, helpful to, to remember. Um, the first is that the data partners a lot of expertise rests with the data partners. And so we very early on uh, called them data partners, not data vendors, as FDA kept saying. Well, what about, what about the data vendors? And the data, the data partners would say, we're not, we're not data providers. We're healthcare providers who happen to have data. So they're at the table. They're involved in any study that uses their data. Um, if, this is go if the distributed model is going to work, it works because the programs that go out, go out and they can be executed as is. So there, there should be no site-specific modification of programs. Um, and then we also said this, whatever this common data model is that we come up with first, um, it has to accommodate everything that Mini Sentinel is required to do, and it has to be flexible enough to adapt to what uh, FDA might want us to do in the future. So, you know, how did we get to the common data model version one? Um, I guess that the answer is uh, lots of teleconferences, meetings, and even more emails. Um, we reviewed a lot of existing common data models, including those that had been used by the HMORN and by other similar kinds of activities. Um, we talked to our data partners, said which ones have you used, which ones haven't you used, or which ones have you not liked, more importantly. Um, you know, we created drafts. We asked people questions like, can you can you capture these data? Do you routinely capture these data? What are the issues? Are they missing? And through this iterative process arrived at what we consider to be version one of the common data model. Um, relies on administrative and claims data, which is exactly what, what FDA wanted us to do um, as, a, as a first pass, and includes five data areas. We have data on enrollment, demographics, outpatient pharmacy dispensing, utilization and mortality, both death and cause of death. Um, even for data partners who had done this kind of work before, this work of transforming, extracting the data you need, transforming it into a common, into these common definitions and loading it into a new database, even for those who'd done it before, this, was, this turned out to be a pretty heavy lift. Um, as I'll show you later, the, we're talking about a lot of data. So these, these um, databases locally are quite large. Um, each of them did this process. They developed the process to transform their data and then documented it in a fairly detailed report that was reviewed centrally. Lots of, lots of questions, lots of discussions on, on conference calls. And then using some standardized programs that the coordinating center had developed, we characterized these data, looked at data quality, and this is an ongoing, ongoing issue. 
Now, something that I didn't mention earlier, but, but that I should have, is that one thing that's really key about all of the data partners that are around the table is that although we're talking about administrative and claims data right now, all of them have the ability to get to electronic medical records or medical charts. And that's really important for, for this kind of work. So the link to that, to that additional information exists. So the database spans from 2000 to 2010, as soon 2011. Um, the HMORN and Kaiser sites have data back to 2000. Um, Health Corps and Humana have data going back a little bit less far than that. Actually, Vanderbilt um, and Aetna will have data probably back in the 2000 uh, for Vanderbilt and mid-2004-05 for um, Aetna. Um, currently, there are about 120 million records in the enrollment table um, for the Mini Sentinel distributed database. Of those, about 80% have both medical and drug coverage, which is really what, what we'll want um, for most of the kinds of analyses that we'll do. Um, those 120 million enrollment records represent about 70 million individuals. Um, when we think about current Current members, um, this is as of, I think, January of 2009, there were about 22 million current members with, with data in, these, in the distributed database. Um, and that, that accumulates about 170 million person uh, years of observation time. And on average, we, we follow people for about 28 months. Again, these are managed care um, kinds of databases, and there is, there is turnover in terms of, of plan enrollment. So as you might expect, the you know distribution by sex is is uh, pretty even. Um, about I think 60 what 65 percent of the um, individuals in the database are between the ages of 20 and 64. Um, the the proportion of um, of individuals who are less than one is actually is quite small, obviously, but that, that amounts to 250,000 kids under the age of, of 52 weeks. Um, so for the folks at FDA and for pediatric researchers, th that's a really big number. For those of us who work with Medicare claims data, it seems kind of small, but, but again, in the pediatric world, that's, that's a big, a pretty big number. Um, so while the, while the data partners were doing the work of transforming and loading data, the coordinating center was continuing to build this infrastructure that would support the ongoing work of, of Mini Sentinel. I mentioned these standardized programs that were developed to characterize and check the quality of the data. Um, we also undertook a formal assessment of the tech environments at each of the data partners' sites. Um, Although I haven't mentioned this, we will be doing quarterly refreshes of these data. So the process of updating and refreshing the data, that happens every quarter. And just laying the groundwork for that quarterly refresh cycle has been an important bit of work in this first year. Um, understanding how long it takes before the data reach stability. In a claims data, there are, there are you know, adjustments along the way. So you you know you want to wait at least a few months before you consider the data to be fairly stable, but the question is how many months do you have to wait? And we'll be answering that. Um, and probably one of the, the most important bit of infrastructure that was developed was a secure web portal for um, distributed analyses. And um, this, this picture actually shows really what, what it is that we're talking about here. So as I mentioned, we have this what we call the firewall, that data from individual data partners, right, gets transformed into these local data sets. And those data sets, patient level data sets, stay behind the firewall. Um, the, this mini Sentinel portal is essentially the, the platform by which queries get distributed to data partners. Data partners go to the portal, they grab the query, they execute the query locally, and then they return aggregated results to the portal, and then those aggregated results are summarized centrally. So this is sort of the process by which this portal works and the process by which queries are distributed and analyzed and answered in, um, in Mini Sentinel. Uh, FDA directs some of those. The Operations Center directs others of those. 
Um, Another really important thing that we've done this year is to develop what we call some modular programs. So um, it's clear in, in talking with FDA that there are going to be certain kinds of questions that they're going to want to address, they're going to want to ask uh, on, in you know, slightly different versions, but they're going to ask those again and again. Like, you know, how many people were exposed to this drug during this period of time? Um, how many people with this condition were exposed to this drug? Um, what about outcomes following exposure to this drug? Or how many people get this combination of these combinations of drugs? So we've developed modular programs that the sites have tested, so they're comfortable with them. They, they think they, they're comfortable with the output and the, the content of those programs so that when FDA has one of these questions, really the process is it's very quick. We just, you know, ran we distributed a query that I think was responded to within maybe two business days, which when you think about the volume of data, it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty impressive um, turnaround. So what's next for the, the data core and, and the data partners? Again, we, the focus now shifts to updating this on a quarterly basis, moving to the quarterly refresh cycles. Um, we're also, um, importantly, adding additional information, adding blood pressure, height, weight, tobacco use. The, um, that will go into another table, a separate table in the common data model. So the common data model is expanding over time. Um, we're also adding selected laboratory test results. So we have a, a work group that's figuring out exactly how to extract from electronic medical records key laboratory tests so that they can be included in the Mini Sentinel Common Data Model. Um, we'll be evaluating methods for, for efficiently extracting electronic health record information. And then also the, sh the focus shifts to expanding this Common Data Model to include inpatient data as well as um, registries. Okay, so that's the whirlwind tour of the data. Um, next, I'll talk briefly about the work that's being done in methods development. Um, this work is, is being led by um, Sebastian Schneeweiss and Jennifer Nelson. Um, and really, this work falls into maybe two broad categories. They're doing some, some work with epidemiology methods, and then they're also doing some statistical methods work. Um, the, on the epidemiology side, um, they have worked to develop what they call a taxonomy of study designs. And um, I think early on it was recognized that, that many Sentinel will be best served if these methodological choices can be made quickly, um, they're well just, justified, and they're transparent. So the idea is, can we not consider the various elements of these, of these questions and then pre-specify a decision table that links a drug event pair or that links characteristics of these drug event or exposure and outcomes with the appropriate method. So uh, what, does, what does that mean? And I'll show you a picture and it might still be kind of confusing. Um, so over here on this side we have six characteristics, what we call characteristics that, that have implications for the design choice, right? This includes things like how persistent is the exposure? Is it one time or is it sustained? Um, is the exposure risk window immediate or is it delayed? Um, and, you know, how long does that exposure risk window last? Um, and what do we, what do we think is, is the strength of confounding, either within person or between person, between, between people? Um, and then over here we have characteristics that have implications for the choice of the analytic approach that we use. And, and the idea is that you can, you know, go down this list and identify where you fit in terms of exposure persistence and follow, follow across and figure out exactly which analytic choice makes the most sense on the basis of the characteristics of the question that you're, that you're asking. Um, so there will eventually be 64 boxes here. Um, and and there, the work group who's working on the taxonomy table, this table, um, I would say they're about maybe 80% done with this, so this will be, should be published within the next um, 
uh, maybe within the next five months or something like that, which is it's really useful. I don't think anyone's done this before. Really useful to have this sort of pre-specified and, and take out the, gosh, how should we answer this one and how should we address this one? Use something that at least provides a, a starting point for those discussions. Um, that's a good question. So the PCORI methods group, to my, well, there is in terms of membership, that, that there certainly is. So Sebastian Schneeweiss is on the PCORI methods group. He's also, he's also the co-lead of this. So I would say that there's a nice uh, connection there. In terms of the work that they've been, been charged to do, I, I'm not, I, I haven't seen much about what the PCORI methods group is actually doing. But in theory, they'll, they'll be well connected. Um, with respect to confounding adjustment, we have another work group that's looking at the utility of high dimensional propensity score analyses, which um, very simply put, um, take you know thousands of covariates and and um, automatically um, reduce, not reduce them, but but automatically select maybe hundreds of covariates to fit an, a propensity score uh, model, to develop a, a propensity model. Um, these have been shown to work very well in, in single large databases. Um, the question is, can you do this in a federated system? Can you do this when you're working in a distributed data network? How exactly does that work? Um, and does it, is it practical for ongoing safety surveillance? Again, we're not talking about doing all retrospective studies. We're talking about um, sequential monitoring even for safety signals. So how would that, how would that work? So we have a work group that's, that's looking at those, those questions. Um, another methods work group is focused on case-based methods, um, looking at to what extent could we use things like self-controlled case series or case crossover designs in this framework? W what do those buy us? Um, have they been used effectively in, this, in these uh, situations before? Can we develop some recommendations for how they would be used in an active safety surveillance model? Um, and then doing empirical work as well. Um, and then another group is looking at regression methods for sequential analyses. And I mean, these certainly have been used in randomized control trials. So the question is, you know, how have they been used in both randomized and non-randomized studies? Um, and you can think about, in some way, there are some parallels, but there are some important differences as well um, that, that would that would come into play. The biggest one, of course, is confounding, which is dealt with by randomization, in a, with randomization in a randomized study. So that, that adds a layer of, of complexity in observational analyses like, like this. Um, and again, what are the gaps? Uh, let's focus on cohort designs in particular and what, what methodological work needs to be done in, in order to support the use of these sequential methods in an active surveillance framework. So in terms of the methods group, uh, their next step, they have an, an active um, an active task right now looking at anonymous linkage between data partners. When you think back to that data characterization slide and the fact that we observe folks on average for 28 months or something like that, um, the, the opportunity to potentially link individuals across, across insurers, across different settings of care, um, there are some fairly interesting methods that have been developed that could, tr that could allow us to do that. So there's an active um, bit of work going on with uh, Corna Cornell Weill Medical Center. They have a large orthopedics device registry um, and doing some anonymous linkage work with uh, one of the large insurers there. Um, statistical methods developing new ones that can be used or adapting existing ones that can be used in this active surveillance um, framework and then doing some assessments of how comparable many Sentinel data are to other national data sources. Um, so finally, let's turn to what's maybe the most interesting piece of all, but the piece that it has yet to get started in, in any full-blown way, and that's the active surveillance component. Um, so the protocol core for these, um, these active surveillance protocols is led by uh, Sean Hennessy and Betsy Krishillis. Um, and in the first year, they did a lot of, I think, really important um, education and 
for lack of a better term, house, housekeeping kinds of work. Um, first of all, they spent a lot of time with FDA um, really, I think, educating them about different evaluation scenarios that make sense in this kind of a data structure, given the administrative and claims data that we have, and those evaluation scenarios that really don't make sense. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a minute. They've also uh, identified and characterized a set of health outcomes of interest and then done systematic reviews of the literature to understand how well those health outcomes of interest have been validated with an eye toward identifying those that really need to be evaluated and validated in many Sentinel data. Um, They've, they're in the process of testing some procedures for obtaining full text hospitalization records and also testing an approach for case finding and adjudication. So they're, they're really sort of doing that, that background work that will be critical when active surveillance protocols are rolled out. Um, and then importantly, they also designed a protocol, an active surveillance protocol, many Sentinels first, looking at um, the, the use of some new oral hypoglycemics and uh, myocardial infarction in, in uh, many Sentinel individuals. So about these evaluation scenarios that I talked about, you know, when you think about what kinds of exposures we could expect to see in a mini sentinel type database, administrative claims data, you know, it's reasonable to expect to see um, uh, prescriptions dispensed by an outpatient pharmacy. We certainly won't see things that are dispensed in hospital. Those data aren't included. Um, keep in mind that we have $4 generics that may uh, undercut what we see in the outpatient pharmacy um, tables. Uh, we can also pick up an outpatient administration of some other therapies depending on whether a specific J code, reimbursement code, has been, has been issued for them. What we can't hope to do at all over-the-counter medications, those are off the table, and again, as well as drugs that are administered in hospital. Um, in terms of outcomes, there are some we can do well and some we cannot do at all. Um, All-cause death, uh, we're, we have, uh, we're pretty confident of that. Um, Cause-specific death, yes, requires the National Death Index Plus. We can, we can get to it in that direction, but there's always the underlying caution about the accuracy of the death certificate diagnoses. Um, we can also look at hospitalization and, and emergency department outcomes. Um, if the event isn't brought to medical attention, we won't observe it in these data. Um, events that aren't coded accurately, whether they occur in the inpatient or outpatient side, we have no hope there. And those things that are not recorded in claims, although, as I mentioned, some of these things are on the short list for the next, the next year. So in terms of, of active surveillance, their next steps um, uh, on the drug side to implement this active surveillance protocol that I mentioned for acute MI related to oral hypoglycemics and then evaluate some emerging safety issues for, for FDA. And I think this is where there's likely to be some very interesting work over the next, over the next several years. Um, here the focus is on new molecular entities and drugs that have been marketed for more than, more than two years. Um, there's also an opportunity now for a work group to evaluate the impact of um, regulatory actions on, on uh, prescribing. Um, and then there's also work on the, on the vaccine side to develop a, what we call a, a successor, a sustainable su successor to that, the ad hoc surveillance um, system that was developed for the H1N1 vaccine. And that, that work is, is going on both in the protocol core and with the, with the data folks. Um, and there, they're really, really looking to link to state immunization registries, which to date has been, has been a real challenge. So I'm certain that I've, I've piqued your interest and all of you are wondering, how can I get involved in FDA's Mini Sentinel initiative? Um, well, step one is to tell me that you're interested. Let me know of your interest and expertise. Um, there's, you know, this is, I think, one of the few, perhaps, federal initiatives that looks to have really solid funding for the next, for the next four years at least. And um, as what we've come to realize, too, is that because we've had a very successful first year, 
people find additional money to throw at successful things because then, you know, Congress, our, our congressmen like to be part of the successes so that they can, they can tell people that they supported it too. So we're, we're in a, it's not a problem, but we're in a situation now where we, we continually find like, oh, we're going to have more money than what we thought. And oh, what else can we do? What are, you know, can we move up some of those priorities? So it's really important for us to, de to build that base of, of collaborators. Um, as you might imagine, there are opportunities developing protocols, developing methods um, on the informatics side. If you're interested in specific clinical areas, specific populations, whatever. There's, I think there's, I, I'm convinced that if you're interested, we probably have work that you could, that you could do. Um, and visit the Mini Sentinel website for more information. Now, when you do, don't click, don't go to minisentinel.com. <laughs> Because if you do, you'll find that for only about $2,400, you could buy that. Now, one thing that's interesting is that a year ago, when, when, when I did that, um, it was selling for $200. And, and four months ago, no, not four months ago, two months ago, before we did the, the Brookings annual meeting, it was selling for, I think, $1,800. So I'm, I'm putting my money on minisentinel.com. <laughs> But here is the, here's the real link. So I would encourage you to check it out. And then I've, my email address is, you know, easy to find and on these slides. So contact me and I'd be happy to talk to you more. And I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Leslie. That was very interesting. Um, you said that you didn't have a way to get at over-the-counter drugs, but what about accessing um, like flex plans? Because I use my little, you know, credit card flex plan card, and I've got to imagine that that's data somewhere. That's an interesting idea. Um, those data would generally reside with the employer. I, I mean, they might, they might not. Sometimes those are run through the traditional pharmacy benefit plan, but sometimes that's 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 a carve out sort of that's that's administered separately by the employer but but that's a good we could certainly check and see that was fantastic um we're really glad that you're leading the data core um i just have one question you said that one of the original um goals was to have longitudinal data for fda to really evaluate things like they've never had in the past and I'm a little confused about um in the current iteration where you have primarily administrative and claims data, presumably you can, you, you're looking for anything in patient, outpatient, whatever happens that's captured in a claim. Mm -hmm. But in terms of your next iteration, what you're gonna add is inpatient data and registry. So what's the backup for getting outpatient records in the same way you may currently be able to get inpatient records? I, I don't have a sense of how much access there is to real world outpatient medicine for these, um, Active, for the act of surveillance. Okay, and, and I, I probably wasn't clear because that's where we actually have very good access on the outpatient side. So this, this common data model is very rich on the outpatient side. It's the inpatient side where it's limited. We're sort of limited to kind of the, the discharge summary type of information. So we know diagnoses and procedures and who saw them, but we don't know about medication administration in hospital settings. We don't know about vital signs. We don't know about laboratory results. That's, that's what we need to work on. Um, on the longitudinal side, so we do, we are, we are good on the, the outpatient bit. Um, we have death. So we do have mortality outcomes for the folks who are included in here. So that helps there. Um, and then really the other thing is to begin to link these together. So we have, there are Medicare claims data. There, there are all different sources. And the question is how can we begin to put these together so that it starts to look like a longitudinal record over more than just the duration of, of your um, enrollment? How about access to outpatient clinical data like GPRD has? Um, do we have any of that in the U.S.? Um, so I guess I would, I would consider the data from, say, the Kaiser outpatient clinics, right, to be of that variety. And so they're all in there. Those are all electronic medical record-based clinics. And so we have data coming directly from those clinics, from those, those administrative systems, if you will. Those, so those are included in here. You can access the chart. And then we can access the chart if we need to. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Hey, that was a great talk and very impressive. Uh, 100 million records and over 20 million uh, persons. And, uh, and while that's very impressive, it, it's actually somewhat scary. Uh, and that uh, how do you know at the end of the day uh, the results are correct and valid? Uh, while uh, it sounds like they're trying to position, the, the group is trying to position themselves as being much in the middle of refinement, I can imagine a day if a study came out or a report came out that said we studied 20 million people on X drug and found this excess MI rate, that that actually would lead to something that would change dramatically the environment to even do a follow-up evaluation study. Uh, so, for example, the rosiglitazone story, mm -hmm. uh, that environment was highly poisoned and they could never finish the trial. Mm -hmm. So how, how is this being handled for many sentinel? I mean, that's a great, that's a great question and, and um, it's the topic of much discussion within FDA. So last fall they convened sort of a, a risk communication panel um, because they recognized that, you know, building this system is great, but what are you going to do with the information that you get out of it? And, you know, what, what Rachel Berman and Judy Bercuse and what they say is Mini Sentinel, this provides FDA with another source of information. It's not, we don't consider it to be definitive, but it's another source of information. And, um, but they also say that they want results of these, of these investigations to be made public within 30 days. So I can tell you that there's a lot of tension. That issue isn't resolved, but all of us who are working on it understand that it's understand that that it needs to be resolved before it goes it goes further. So, did you want to be involved in that working group? <laughs> <laughs> <I've heard. laughs> Got your name. Yes, yes, and that's a great question. So on the, on the pharmacy side, we, kept, we know day's supply, right? So again, we're looking at just things like that possession ratio. We, can't, we don't know whether they actually took the medications, but we have, we have at the NDC level, we have day's supply, and it, so we, we can definitely calculate possession ratios and adherence. Emil? Yeah, I had uh, two small questions. Are you thinking about doing this internationally or globally? And two, uh, what about is this system designed to do long-term follow-up because you're following them for a relatively short period of time? And I would guess that FDA has an interest in looking at drugs and cancer outcomes down the road. Right. So the the issue of of the international component actually came up at our at our January meeting and. Um, I'd say that FDA is definitely open to that. Um, the, the FDA amends, Amendments Act really does focus more on domestic, building this domestic resource, but to the extent that there are international resources that we should be tapping into to compare the results of our studies to, I think they're very open to that. And, and you're right, I mean, on the, the longitudinal aspect here is really important. And so over the, you know, over the next year or two, we need to figure out how to, how to begin to stretch those, those not exposures, stretch those enrollment periods or, or link enrollment periods of individuals so that we can create that, that longer term perspective. Conveniently, someone turned it off before they handed it to you. <laughs> no, the, uh, uh, this is all, uh, it's been a huge amount of work, I know, because I see you on the uh, conference calls all the time with the door closed. The, um, um, but the first year has really been spent building the infrastructure for this. Um, have you guys played with the data yet? Have you seen what this looks like and what comes back? And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess to some level, to Adrian's point, is it, it, can it really deliver on this? Um, and on the glitazones, have you, have you been able to play with that? Yeah, uh, actually we have. So um, the answer is yes, and we've, um, the, the uh, protocol that I mentioned, we've actually done some initial, and we've, we've run programs, we've done some initial analyses of that, um, and we've, you know, FDA's created a list of like, let's look at these exposure outcome pairs, um, 
let's see what the numbers look like. Let's decide, you know, whether we need to, what we should do in addition. Um, I'd actually, we were really excited because we we had actually done an analysis. Some, I mean, not not. Um, not detailed, but had done this basic analysis in the data. And so for our annual meeting in, in January, we were eager to sort of show, like, let's show some real data. And then, you know, FDA sort of went, <coughs> yeah, we, you can't show data yet. We can't, to, to Adrian's point, we can't, we can't show any data yet. We just have to tell people that we've done it. Trust us, we've done it. Um, so. <laughs> Well, actually, that, that is, I mean, for an overpowered study like this, I mean, you could also, this this is like genomics mining. I mean, it's not a P of 0.05, so part of it would be, you know, what what is a hazard ratio that you guys think mm -hmm. is, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and what are the p-values that are appropriate given the sample sizes? So that, you know, maybe that should be part of the methods. Adrian would be happy to work on that. Actually, I just wrote your <laughs> name down. I wrote your name down for that one, Kevin. Thanks. Leslie, I have so many questions, but one of them, oh, no. so the mini, no, I'm not going to give them all, but the mini sentinel work you said is deemed not research yes. for right now. Yes. I mean, this is a huge resource you're creating. Um, a lot of academic people are involved. Um, the research community is involved. Is there a vision right now for what that's going to be like in the future, how it's going to be managed? And if everything done with this is always going to be called public health or? No, and that's, and it's clear that that won't. That's not the case. Um, Janet Woodcock envisions this as being a, a, a resource, a national resource for whether it be for comparative effectiveness, for safety, for all sorts of, of kinds of, of research questions. Um, how we get from here to there is, is a different question. I think it, it just takes time. The, the public health practice is probably the first thing to go. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. And, and honestly, the, it's, um, the other challenge is when you think about the whole, the model, the, the, principle, mm -hmm. the principles on which the data partners, or the, the, what they signed up to do, right? Mm -hmm. They signed up to be part of this, to be actively engaged in, in this work. Um, and you could imagine how academics like me might want to just sort of ask questions, like pepper the system with questions, but not actually involve all those pesky data people in the question. And so really working out how that, how that works optimally, um, I, think, I think that's a few years down the road. Um, but, but definitely FDA is very, talks a lot about that. And I will say, some of you may know about this multi-payer database that's been, um, that was funded with our money. Um, and that's being coordinated out of ASPE. And they, you know, they originally thought that they were going to create this multi-payer database, bring all sorts of data together, and um, then make that available for research purposes. And quickly learned that data, people who have data aren't really so keen on giving all their data to someone else, even if it's de-identified. And so what's actually happened is that they've decided to use the Mini Sentinel common data model. So whatever's being, in, this is rare, right? Whatever's being developed in that wing of HHS will actually work with what's being developed in this wing of HHS. So, you know, if you look forward 10 years and squint, you kind of see maybe these things start to be useful for things other than what they're being created for. Um, I was just thinking about um, what Adrian and um, Kevin talked about in terms of accuracy and then the whole issue about public health versus research. And another way to look at this is that um, in terms of what we have now for surveillance, it really stinks, right? Yeah. In terms of understanding right. drugs on the market and real world practice. We really don't, I mean, all these individual, you know, spontaneous reports, we know that, you know, there's tremendous underreporting. How to interpret it, no one knows. So, you know, I think rather than thinking of this as, you know, it's got to be perfect and it's got to be you know, the answer. I mean, just having this information, I mean, their concept of providing to the FDA a source of actively looking at questions that are of in public health interest is exciting. And the other thing I would like to say is, if we look at the glass half full side of the thing about research use versus public health use, how exciting to have this much available to answer important public health questions, which where the overlap with with academic research has to be tremendous. Right, right. I mean, what's our primary interest in doing research in clinical domains is to understand public health risk and benefit. 
and this, you know, it's the same goal as FDA. So I, I actually think the fact that you can actually get a query answered in two days because you don't have to go through IRB approval and you can get a relevant safety issue for the public health answered is the most exciting thing I've heard in this room in a long time. So I think it's a glass half full situation. And that's a perfect segue to Doc, who might have something to say about the IRB. You mean, you well, really well, actually, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did. My main question was getting 80% with drug and claims data seems to me is mostly Kaiser and the other HMOs that clinical sites aren't going to have both of those pieces. So Humana, Humana, Health Corp have both of those pieces. Right, right? that's an HMO. Yeah, that's and right. And so is Kaiser. And so is Kaiser. But Vanderbilt's Vanderbilt, not. Vanderbilt does, uh, but they're bringing in TenCare. They're bringing in TenCare, which has all of the, that's their Medicaid. That's their Medicaid. Right, but that's all, you know, it's a very small sub, it's a relatively small subset of their entire population that's available. And, it, it you know, so it, I'm not sure whether there are biases that need to be yep examined there because mm -hmm. of the ascertainment. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of long-term follow-up and linkage uh, certainly can be done. It needs to be done at what's called the limited data set level. It cannot be done as de-identified, even though Dan Mesa says it can, mm -hmm. um, unless you go to OCR and get a ruling. Cause Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Huh. That, well, and actually, something that, that I think I, I mentioned, but it, it bears repeating, um, this Mini Sentinel is considered the pilot of the Sentinel initiative, and I think from FDA's perspective, that gives it a whole lot of wiggle room. So Adrian's question about what are they going to do with all this information, and how do we know that it's valid and reliable? Right now, FDA can say this is just a pilot. It's just a pilot. We're going to try and figure this out. I think the, it has to be figured out by the time Mini Sentinel becomes the Sentinel initiative. That's when that's when the the rubber truly hits the road. But until then, we have we have some we have some space, I think, to operate behind that that pilot. What's the wow. The you know, they're kind of vague on that. Mini Sentinel, it's a it's a five year it's a five year. I think when when we finally say, hey, this is working, and we know what we're doing, then they change. They get rid of the mini, maybe. But I mean, Mini Sentinel, the contract is a five year contract, renewable for an additional three years, four years. So I mean. They've given they've given quite a bit of time, so. Okay. I'd like to thank Dr. Curtis for her excellent presentation. Thank you.